Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu salam wa rasulillah wa ala wa sahbihi wa man wala. First of all, I want to welcome you all on behalf of Mass uh, to this convention and then afterwards welcome you on behalf of Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research to the Confident Muslim Session of the Year. Alhamdulillah, this has been something that we do every year and we have a chance to actually get to know people who are well known to the public but perhaps the depth of their Islam is not known and we want to celebrate that and sometimes there are people who you might not know so well but who made incredible sacrifices or contributions with their Islam and give us a chance to really speak through what that process looks like. And Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, you know, last year we had the blessing of being here with Dr. Yusuf Salam. The brother that we are going to be speaking with today is a special brother, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, who despite having an illustrious career, especially in college basketball, went on now to be influential, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, in the Muslim space and is actually a youth director at the Islamic Education Center of Allentown, Pennsylvania, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, IECPA. And as I introduce him, inshallah ta'ala, you're going to get to know certain layers about this brother, bi'ithnillah. But to give you a few highlights, he's a three-time Ivy League champion, two-time Ivy League player of the year, one-time Big Five player, the Ivy League record holder in steals, and a Philadelphia Basketball Hall of Famer, Inshallah ta'ala, please welcome Brother Ibrahim Jabir. Yeah, it is. Jabir does a nice job off the jump ball. And gets oh, an easy two and it strips Felton. Oh, Jabber puts it in. Jabber played his college ball at Penn. He's also played in Greece and now Italy. Brooklyn, born in Brooklyn. And he's forced some turnovers. Comes off the bench right away, has an impact as the Knicks now trail by three. Java are providing the impetus. Two quick baskets and now the turnover. Thanks, but I'm looking forward to working with him. Felton's very confident. Moskov, who was impressive in the first half, zone. Petrov can't finish. And there's Jabber again with the steal. Gets it to Petrov. <laughs> so. Jabber has showed he's a good player. Nice, active, hard working player. Yeah, nothing flashy, very solid there. Again, on the defense, Ian Douglas going at it. And one more basket, they'll have the crowd again. Nice, Gallinari's just 22 years old. Timely threes by Gallo. Oh, look at this guy, man. Yeah, forcing the turnover, releasing is Randolph. Again, Randolph, but this time he lost it. Who was there? Jabba. This guy's ubiquitous on the D. Got the long arms and he uses them to create havoc. That's quite a bit preseason. Oh, there he is. And there's again. This guy's a, always in the passing lane. Jabber puts it in. Look at his arms. You can get a look at his arms that are like down to his uh, knees. Yeah. Extremely long arms for a short guy. Happiness or the lackadaisical Walker went for the steal and Mancinelli kicks it back out. And that leaves a wide open three and knocking it down once again as Ibrahim Jabber. Is that are going to be guarding him. As we'll see this three-pointer set up nicely. This kid has been terrific tonight, Java, especially on the deep. 14 points for Java. Chamberlain. Well, this rule, you can't touch the ball until it hits the rim. So you can't get it on the initial shot attempt. It has to hit the rim first. Then you can knock it right off. The lane was changed by George Mikan. As Java continues to astound. Thank you. And the new look Knicks with 11 new players on the roster get their feet wet together at some good moments, at some rough moments as well. Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah, I begin. I praise him before I raise my pen. I seek refuge in him from the evil within and the enticing whispers of mankind and jinn. Oh Allah, won't you guide my pen, make right what I write, and erase my sins. 
Thereafter, I extend the best of salutations to the best and the most blessed of Allah's creation, the last of all prophets and a mercy to all nations. In his example, there is love. In his footsteps, there is salvation. And to bear witness to his greatness is one of the highest declarations for the messenger of Allah is a praiseworthy station and to Allah the most high is the greatest obligation. Allah perfects his light without need of his creation. Rather, we are in need of our deeds and supplications. So may these words find acceptance in the highest congregation and in this life and the next be a means of elevation. Allahumma ameen. Everything the Quran touches turns to gold. So don't be afraid to let it touch your soul. From the house of might to the mountain of light, on a powerful night, when the hour was right, there came down from the heavens an astounding sight, caught the eyes of a man who could neither read nor write, in the grasp of an angel being squeezed so tight. See, even when man can barely breathe, he still has the need to recite. O oh, you who believe, respond to Allah and the Messenger when they call you to that which gives you life. Everything the Quran touches turns to gold. So don't be afraid to let it touch your soul. An unlettered man in the mouth of a cave until Allah cast his light into the heart of his slave. That same light with all of its rays brought men out of darkness, honored and raised, brought women out of bondage, celebrated and praised, brought the daughters of darkness out of the bottom of graves. If ignorance is a prison for those stuck in their ways, then the Quran is the key that unlocked the cage. Everything the Quran touches turns to gold, so don't be afraid to let it touch your soul. Virtuous verses, miraculous signs, magnificent melodies, majestic rhymes, timeless lessons in every line, parables so powerful they boggle the mind. Place the book before you and follow behind and it will lead you to paradise one verse at a time. But if you place it behind you and turn away from his signs, it will drive you into the fire and you'll be raised up blind. The greatest revelation revealed throughout time. The greatest miracle ever witnessed by mankind in the Arabic language, the clearest of all tongues, and it was revealed in the best two places under the sun. The noblest month is when Allah chose to send it down, and if it were revealed upon a mountain, it would have crumbled to the ground. No night is more blessed than the night it was revealed. And who better to bring it down than the angel Jabril from the trustworthy in the heavens to the trustworthy in the earth. None better than our prophet in the whole universe. When this world had turned cold, its corners wretched and dark, and everything seemed ready for revelation to start, Allah cast his light into the most blessed of hearts, because the heart to the body is the most blessed of parts. It is the testimony of God. There was never a better nation. And the companions of the Prophet, the best generation, the Quran, the Quran, for those who understand, hands down the greatest favor ever bestowed upon man. Virtuous verses, miraculous signs, magnificent melodies, majestic rhymes, timeless lessons in every line, parables so powerful they boggle the mind.
Inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to do a snippet of a poem that I wrote or started writing about 12 hours ago <laughs> on my way here. Um, but I felt that it was relevant and it was a way that I could summarize some of what we're actually going to be talking about in the interview following this poem, inshallah ta'ala. To emerge from this earth with a clean heart is an incredible feat. To pass through the pastures of death and deceit without the same type of scars as the rest of the sheep, hold hell by the hand, kiss death on the cheek, and still come out from calamity with a blessing to speak. What have I survived? I survived the calamity of sin, the murmurs of the jinn, the perfectly obedient angels scraping with their pens, writing what I've done in the places that I've been to the point I used to wonder if I could ever be cleansed. I survived my own wrath a hot-tempered boy with an ice-cold laugh. I survived fear, I survived doubt. 15 years old, just trying to figure things out. I survived urban America, the lion's den, not by running away, but by becoming the lion's friend. I survived rejection on the basis of my faith. I survived oppression on the basis of my race. I survived jealousy and envy with a smile upon my face. I could have chose revenge in the end, but instead I chose grace. I survived the awkward feeling of feeling out of place in sold out arenas with barely any space. I survived the stares and the glares after prayers beneath the stairs, interrogations in the airport and burning hot chairs. I survived random security check after random security check after random security check and it only increased me in self-respect. I survived the five hour wait at the terminal between Jordan and Philistine just to let them know how much two units of prayer in Al-Aqsa really means I survived 9-11 as a teenage kid and the hurtful jokes of my peers saying look at what your cousins did. I survived the pain of every media smear campaign devised to demonize Islam. I survived their every attempt to scrutinize the Quran. I survived the satire against the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and the more they try to mock him the more we are increased in a man. I survived all the lies and the claims. I survived the one million times you mispronounced my name by Allah's permission. I survived the pipeline from public school to prison. I survived. I'm still alive despite the poison in my system. I survived the poison of the system designed to attack the mind and destroy another victim. I survived systemic racism and the war on terror at the same time. Somehow I came out with with a sane mind, I survived the storm of mental illness as it swept past my home. Good thing my mother and my, fa my father raised me to be strong. I survived my own criticism only to improve. If I'm competing with myself, then I can never lose. I survived. I'm alive. My body is still whole. But if you take a look inside, you'd probably find a million holes in this life. I've survived many blows, but the injuries I sustain are still taking a toll. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I forgot to mention he was a spoken word artist. It's probably the most important part, but I actually wanted him to, survive, to, to surprise you all, not survive you all, to surprise you all uh, when he came out. Jazakallah uh, khair, Ibrahim, for that beautiful um, poetry. And subhanAllah, I was asking, I was like, you just wrote that one on the way here? So that was the one that was 12 hours ago. Uh, you can look up, mashallah, a lot of his poetry, his spoken word uh, on his YouTube channel, Ibrahim Jabir. But before that, I think that a lot of people are wondering, what is your story? So um, you played basketball in college, made it to the NBA, then played internationally and then became a spoken word artist and 
uh, working with Masjid Youth. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the journey, inshallah ta'ala. How do you introduce yourself in five minutes? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Um, first, I would like to uh, thank you personally for reaching out for this opportunity. Um, despite me uh, truly not deserving uh, to be recognized in this manner, I feel though as though I meet Muslims that are more confident than me and more, you know, uh, pious than me, you know, every week. You know, so I really am humbled to have this opportunity uh, to be here at, at the Mass Ikna conference. Uh, for the very first time and also to um, share my story with the Yaqeen family as well. And before we begin, I do have a gift for you. Touch of gold, Quran-inspired poetry. Barakallahu feek. I'd like to begin by saying that I was born rich. <laughs> I was born rich. And not because of any monetary value, any material possessions, but because of the legacy that I inherit as a Muslim. Um, it is sufficient to be from the Ummah of Muhammad والسلام, and the Ummah of the Quran. It is sufficient of a blessing. But in addition to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He decreed for me a very, very unique Islamic legacy in terms of Islam in America, All right? So I'm a third generation American born Muslim, meaning that my grandfather was born in America and he was Muslim. And my father was born Muslim and now I'm third generation American born Muslim, All right? So if anybody is third generation, <laughs> let's get a show of hands. Third generation American born Muslims above the age of 25. Uh, how many hands do you see? <laughs> very. I see, I see one who's very enthusiastic about Masha it. MashaAllah, so. we have to connect after, inshaAllah ta'ala, right? But it is a very, very rare strain. My grandfather, Hisham Jabir, rahimahullah, may Allah ta'ala have mercy upon him. He accepted Islam in 1955 through an organization called the Adinullah Universal Arabic Association, the AAUAA, that was founded upon Quran and Sunnah in the early 1930s by Professor Muhammad Azuddin. And my grandfather is most notably, or most known for, uh, his involvement in the janazah of Malcolm X, Haj Malik Shabazz. And during a very confusing time where there was a lot of turmoil and chaos surrounding the assassination of our brother, Haj Malik, rahimahullah, my grandfather stood up in that moment to give Malcolm his final rites. And he performed the janazah for Haj Malik despite the death threats on his life and others and the harassment of his family and the fact that his oldest son at that time was about 12 years old. And my grandmother, she encouraged him to do so regardless of the consequences. And I'm mentioning this because this is obviously a part of my early development. These are my, bed story, my bedtime stories as a kid, right? And I'm hearing about, you know, my grandfather's involvement even in the plight of the Palestinians where he would gather my father and my uncles at the UN in, the, in New York and they would be protesting, saying Palestine, Palestine for the Palestinian people. And so that is a part of the legacy that I inherited as a youth. And also my grandfather played basketball in the army. <laughs> he played all army in Berlin. So what happened was he went to Morehouse to actually become a minister to carry on his father's ministry as a Christian. He had questions, he had doubts, he had frustrations. He ended up in the army and then he traveled to Algeria and Morocco and he was exposed to Islam. And so as soon as he came back to the U.S., he started searching for what he saw in Morocco and Algeria until he came across the Adinola and he accepted Islam then and he never looked back. 
and then he rose in the ranks with his diligence until he became the national imam, and that's how he actually ended up in position to do the janazah for Malcolm. Right? However, with that legacy, you would think that I would grow up being a perfect Muslim, right? <laughs> no, everybody has to have their own journey, their own struggles. And so despite me having that there, those seeds planted, right, I still had to grow up and mature and to learn how to walk on my own, you know? <laughs> and my father, who was also connected to the Shabazz family as he did the internment for um, Dr. Betty Shabazz when she passed away. At the age of 13, when I was in my middle school prime, we just won the seventh grade championship in the city of Richmond, Virginia. So in my mind, I have eighth grade left, I'm gonna be the star player on the team, right? But Allah had a different plan and also my father had a different plan. He told me that we were going to go to Morocco for one year, and we were going to begin to study the Arabic language and start to memorize the Quran, and we would be immersed in a culture uh, where there were Muslims, and you can hear the Adhan and so forth and so on. And at the age of 12, Morocco to me sounded like the moon. <laughs> like, what do you mean we're going to Morocco? You know? And I didn't want to go, but of course I'm not going to dispute with my father's decision, but I did make dua that we wasn't going to go. <laughs> and so on the way to the airport, just when we got into New York City, we got sideswiped. <laughs> And I was like, yes, my dua is being answered. We're going to go back to uh, school. I'm going to go back to my eighth grade basketball team, and everything's going to be just fine, right? But that is not what happened. We ended up in Morocco, and it turned out to really be one of the best experiences that I ever had in my life. Every morning we got up, and I was the youngest of the group that went. And so my father, he made me the mu'adhin. We're just out of reach of the masajid in the area, so we prayed in the villa. And so I had to get up before everybody and, and make the call to prayer. I had to make the da'wah to prayer, right? And we would do Qur'an after Fajr all the way into the duha prayer, right? And I remember the transformation taking place inside of me where I felt like, wow, this is Islam. Not what I was experiencing when I was the only Muslim on the block or the only Muslim in my school or the only Muslim on my basketball team, but now I felt like I was a part of something that was universal, something that was international, right? And so after that experience, this is a long story, Sheikh. <laughs> um, actually, I played basketball in Morocco. And one of the lessons that I learned is that when you sacrifice for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you never lose in the end. In fact, you only gain more. And what I gained playing basketball in Morocco was much more than I would have gained by playing for my eighth grade team, right? Because I was American, they say, here's the ball, right? MashaAllah, tabarakallah. I'm sure we got a, a lot of Morocco <laughs> soccer team fans. Or oh, football yeah, yeah, fans so you know I'm awesome. representing. I'm representing, mashallah. And I remember my first game in Morocco, I'll try to make this short, inshallah. It was raining cats and dogs, right? Third world basketball, not the luxury gymnasiums that I was used to. And so I'm watching as it's pouring down, raining, it's even thundering and lightning. And all of my teammates are getting dressed. And I'm like, why are you guys getting dressed? What's happening? And I'm looking at them strange, and they're looking at me strange, <laughs> right? We have a game to play. And it was the most difficult basketball game that I probably ever played. It was soaking wet, the ball was catching puddles, the rim was crooked, the ball was sliding through your hands. Every time you change direction, you're falling on the ground. And the other team was playing like they were on the uh, Madison Square Garden floor. They were like snapping, snapping, snapping. 
And in that moment, I could have laid down, right? Or I could have gotten over the excuses and dug in and figured out a way. And that's what actually happened, right? And so I realized there's two type of people. You have victims of circumstance and you have victors of circumstance. And that is the example of the Prophet والسلام, in his totality, that all odds were stacked against him from the time that he was born <laughs> until the time that he died, right? But he never made excuses about him, his circumstances, right? And so that was a really, really deep lesson that I, I learned at a very early age that I will be reminded of constantly throughout the course of my life. So you see a brother playing basketball, and I know that, you know, growing up, you're watching the NBA, you see someone with a Muslim name, you go, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> and you don't realize that the guy playing on the court is the grandson of the person that prayed Janaza on Malcolm X. And actually, can we get that picture up for a moment, inshallah, I don't know if they have it back there. So to the right is the famous picture of the grandfather, Sheikh Hisham Jabir. Rahimahullah, praying over Al-Hajj Malik al-Shabazz Malcolm X Rahimahullah Ta'ala, leading his janazah. To the left is the death of Dr. Bari Shabazz Rahimahullah, and Sheikh Ibrahim's father, Sheikh Muhammad Jabir, led the janazah of Dr. Bari Shabazz. And then when Malika, the daughter of Al-Hajj Malik al-Shabazz, passed away, may Allah have mercy on her, your uncle led the janazah of Malika Shabazz. So the three members of the Shabazz family that have passed away, may Allah have mercy on them all, all had a Jabir <laughs> leading the prayer, alhamdulillah, Rabbi. I mean, that's something that belongs to you all, inshallah ta'ala, in that regard. But there's a history there, and there's blood that runs through us sometimes. You've got a, a grandfather who literally risked his life. And there's a book, by the way, you all can read, called I Buried Malcolm. I Buried Malcolm, which is actually written by Sheikh Hisham Jabir, rahimahullah ta'ala. And he risked his life to do that. And that blood f flows through you. Alhamdulillah, Rabbi. I mean, you got the example of your, your father. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him. That blood flows through you. What were you able to lean on giving up so much, making, up, making so many sacrifices? What were you able to lean on with them? How do you look back at them and say, you know what? I can't relinquish my Islamic identity when I'm going through these different phases of my life because this is who I come from. <sighs> so when I was playing college basketball, and you mentioned some of my accolades, I wanna, I wanna make sure I mention two things. Um, three Ivy League championships, uh, two Ivy League player of the year, big five player of the year, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I'm humbled by, by all of those things. And sometimes I would just sit with myself and I would wonder why someone like myself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to, to really just bestow those things on me, right? Things that I'm not deserving. And so I would reflect like, is there something I did? You know, the footsteps of Bilal, like what is it you're doing that, uh, that I heard your footsteps before me, right? So I would also reflect like, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless me in my basketball career, right? And the answer that I'm content with is that I have a sister, Saida Jabber, Rahimahullah, who was special needs. And me being the youngest and her being special needs, we would pair together often because she had to stay alongside my mother. And through interacting with her, I learned a different type of patience. And she's one person that I would say was more loyal to me than I could ever have been to her. And she outdid every single person in my family in terms of keeping the ties of kinship. And she was my biggest fan. And so when I was a teenager, you know, winning championships and doing these types of things, Saida also loved the game of basketball. 
And so sometimes when my older brothers were going out to play, she would ask me to stay behind and play with her in the driveway. And that is really the only thing that I can think of that is worthy of those banners and those accolades, right? Sometimes you do, you sacrifice in one space and Allah blesses you in another, right? And the second thing that I want to make sure I say is that in my college years, it were the most challenging years that I had in terms of maintaining my Islamic identity and maintaining my faith. And at the end of my senior year, at the time of graduation, I'm preparing for the NBA draft. I graduate on May the 16th. And my brother Yusuf, my best friend and my mentor, he said, your grandfather has fallen sick. So make sure you visit him before you go to Vegas. He knew I was on my way to Vegas to do the training. And so I arrived in Elizabeth, New Jersey from Philadelphia while I was playing college on May the 16th. And I went to the hospital and I arrived at the doorway of his room. And on my left is my grandmother who has her head down putting something away in her bag. And on the right is my grandfather laid out on his hospital bed. And so he's the first one who saw me standing in the door because my grandmother was busy and his face lit up. And so I came in, I greeted them, I kissed my grandmother, and then I went to stand next to my grandfather and I took his hand. And my grandmother said to me, we were just talking about you. <laughs> and she reached back in her bag. She was putting away my basketball card. <laughs> and then she said, today's his birthday. It was his 76th birthday. And that was ironic for me because that was the first time that I had ever encountered him on a birthday. And he was laying on his deathbed. And I was preparing for the draft, so I left to Vegas, and by the time I came back, I got to visit him one more time before he passed away. And his janaza was like a historic event because he gave so many people shahada. He did the nikah for so many people you know, and he had such a big influence even on the influx of immigrants who were coming in, helping them get established in the U.S. and so forth. And it was actually a dispute over who's actually going to carry the casket. And it was the first time that my entire tribe had been back together probably in, a, in about a decade, right? And so seeing that sight and participating in his janaza and lowering him into the grave really shook me to the core. And I had to ask myself in that moment, am I going to allow this legacy to, to die? Or am I going to pick up the banner and carry it forward into the future? And that was really the beginning of my, my transformation, right? that the, word, the, the last thing that I ever wanted to be growing up was an imam. <laughs> no offense to anybody, but that's not what I wanted. That's probably one of the reasons why I started writing poetry, because I did want to express certain things, but I didn't feel like being an imam was something that I wanted to be in the future. But that moment in history, in my history, really changed, changed my life, and subhanAllah, I didn't go to the draft. I got sent overseas. My agents didn't tell me the full story, but at the end of the day, it's the best thing that happened to me. And I took with me about three books. The Quran, my companion, the stories of the prophets, and the book that you mentioned, I buried Malcolm. And I committed during that time 
to revise the book. That was probably 13 years ago. <laughs> Yesterday, I submitted for the sample of the revised version of I Bury Malcolm. <laughs> to preserve. <laughs> to preserve the legacy of Malcolm and to also preserve the legacy of my grandfather as well. Jazakallah khair. SubhanAllah, extremely moving and I didn't even know that. So uh, the book, I Buried Malcolm, wait for the revised version, inshallah ta'ala, as well, by inshallah ta'ala, Sheikh Ibrahim Jabir. And actually, subhanAllah, last, I believe it was two years ago, or last year, um, in February, uh, we have an interview at Yaqeen Institute of you and your father talking about some of the things behind the scenes with the death of Malcolm X and the death of uh, Dr. Betty Shabazz and Dr. Ahmed Usman, Hafidahullah, who spoke at the Janaza after Ozzie Davis, an interview with him as well. So it's important for people to know this history, to know the legacies that went into this, because this is not possible without those people. This is not possible as a convention, this is not possible as a cause. And then the, the stars uh, behind the scenes, your sister, Rahimahullah, you know, mashallah, I want to also applaud Mass for giving space to Muhsin. Muslims understanding and helping with special education needs, alhamdulillah, to make this convention a special needs friendly convention because those are shining stars in our lives and they're parts of our legacy as well. And we're hopefully parts of their legacy as well, bi ta'ala. In the last minute, inshallah ta'ala, you got young people in here that face the struggle of being confronted with their Islam and they have these lofty dreams. You tasted a little bit of what that lofty dream is. Every, every single, you know, or not every single young Muslim uh, man, but a lot of people want to grow up and play in the NBA. A lot of people want to know what it's like to be at that highest level, to be in a locker room with NBA players, to experience that joy of victory, to be a celebrated Hall of Famer. Um, what do you say to young Muslims that struggle with their identity about making those types of sacrifices when everything around you tries to undermine your Islam and you're the only person that's kind of holding on to it? What do you say to them? <laughs> Our time is up, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, that's a very, very um, heavy question. Um, but, um, as the expression goes, the higher up you go, the thinner the air, right? The more difficult it is to actually maintain your identity in those spaces, right? And in fact, one of the reasons that I parted from basketball is because, not only because, but because it was a very, very isolating experience being a practicing Muslim in that space, right? A lot of the conversations, they're not fruitful. Um, and you're a stranger in that space other than when you're cooperating and playing the game. I'm sitting on the bus and I'm reading my Quran. They're sitting on the bus and they're talking about this celebrity and that celebrity, you know? So it's not really what it seems. You know, it looks so glamorous from a distance, right? But when you taste it for yourself, right, you really realize that it's not all that they, or you think it is, you know? So don't be deceived by the big facade, you know? Um, <laughs> and there's so much I, I can say about this topic, but, you know, it's really not what it seems. You said in the beginning that you were born rich yeah. because you were born with Islam, alhamdulillah, and you got to grow up with that. And I think that for a lot of us, I don't know if you know this, but I could have been an NBA player. You know? <laughs> <laughs> He's seen my shot. It's not great. We were talking about it. It's, it's ugly form, but he said it's all in the fingers. That's all it is. As long as you're making your shot, it's okay. But um, on, a, on a serious note, what you said is so profound. 
When you have Islam, when you have faith, that is greater than any accomplishment, greater than any career, greater than any legacy, greater than any medal, greater than anything else that you can hang on yourself or have in your heart. And alhamdulillah, Rabbil Ameen, here you are. And on behalf of everyone here, Jazakallah khair, may Allah reward you and your family. Ameen. And Ameen. your family for what they did for Islam in America. And Allahu Allah Akbar. Akbar. And uh, Touch of Gold, Quran-inspired poetry by Ibrahim Jabir. Where do they find this? Where do they find the book? They can find it at colormemuslim.com. Colormemuslim.com. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.